read just shortly, and then Mary and I are going to check and this is our way. Um, uh, this novel has many parts, and it, it, it is in part about the, um, the ship, the Mary Celeste, which in 1872 was found off the coast of the Azores. Um, the ship was in pretty good condition, and it was just floating around in the wrong direction. And <coughs> It had had 10 people aboard, the captain, his wife and daughter, and a small crew. Uh, and no one knew why they left. Uh, it was a mystery that was never solved. It became big news because the, um, the salvers brought the ship in to um, Gibraltar. And there was a salvage hearing that went on for three months. And so it was big news in both in, in Britain and the United States. But an interesting thing about what happened, um, because of that trial, was that differing stories started coming out right away, and um, some of the facts were um, contested by various people who had an interest. Um, within a couple of days, the reports in, in papers, such as New York papers, uh, were filled with what were called facts that were actually totally complete errors, you know, just small things like, was the ship towed, um, or was it sailed, and it was, in fact, sailed, you'd be glad to know. Um, Anyway, some years later, 12 years later, Arthur Conan Doyle, who was a young doctor at the time and had heard about that mystery when he was in school, was looking around for something, to, some subject to, to write a story that would actually sell. And he decided to solve this mystery of the Mary Celeste. So he wrote a short story which was published without his name on it. It was called J. Howard Jepson's Statement. And people thought it was a true story. And it was even more outrageous than any of the fabricated uh, solutions to the mystery than anything that had come before. He um, created a situation in which at the very last minute, um, a passenger got on board and he was a former slave who hated white people and had his, his intention was to kill as many as he could. So first he throws the baby overboard and then the mother jumps after it and the father shoots himself and it's three down. <laughs> so it's really, it's out. It's like an imperialist fantasy. Um, it's an amazing story. You can go online and read it. Um, I did get a review recently that spent more time um, being shocked by that story than anything my novel. It's a little discouraging. But, uh, um, so, uh, so Arthur Conan Doyle is a character in this novel. And in this short scene I'm going to read you, he is on a ship called the Mayomba. As a young doctor, he sailed first on a whaler called the Hope, and he went to the Arctic. His diaries from that trip have recently been, been pub published and they're quite interesting. And while he was on the Hope, he would cover seals with everybody else and he went out on the whale boats and um, he didn't actually stab a whale, but he got really close enough and he wanted to do it, um, but he wasn't experienced. And he was a good surgeon, he was good with a, with a knife. Uh, and he loved that trip, he had a great time on, in the Arctic. And then he couldn't make any money as a doctor and he wasn't selling his story. So, he signed on to be ship surgeon on a trip, a ship going to Africa. And it's really a wonderful thing to think about this great Scott going first to the Arctic and being perfectly happy, killing, clubbing baby seals. <laughs> but his second trip is to Africa and he has to be a ship's doctor to passengers, basically. Um, for, you know, for the most part, they've had pretty many passengers, people who have been bringing in and taking out homo and one other thing. Um, so it's a very different sort of job. Uh, and the ship left uh, Britain and almost immediately got into some really stormy waters and they uh, almost foundered in the Bay of Biscay and then um, finally they arrived in, in calm waters. So this scene, which is called The Conversation with the Captain, takes place after the storm when they have arrived in calm waters on the ship Miami. Um And it begins with, a, with an epigraph. One ship which I call to mind now has a reputation of killing somebody every voyage she made. That's from Joseph Conrad's wonderful book about the sea called uh, Near the Sea. Like mushrooms after a rain, the passengers commenced popping up everywhere. They paraded on the saloon deck, converged in the saloon and in their dining room. Passing one another on their shipboard excursions, they chattered volubly in the passageway. In the afternoon, cards were broken out, and the doctor joined his charges for a game of whist. All the hatches were open, the air was fresh, and one could sit at the table with a glass of wine or brandy with no need to hold tightly to the stem. The day passed pleasantly, and in the evening, Dr. Doyle took his dinner with the officers. 
Over brandy, Captain Wallace entertained him with stories of the sights afforded the tourists to the dark continent. He told of native tribes who offered human sacrifice to alligators, which devilish creatures swarmed ashore when they knew their tribute was due. One could hear, he said chillingly, the screams of the victims for miles down the river. On another occasion, the captain had seen a human skull protruding from a giant anthill, a fate, he learned, reserved by one tribe for its enemies in another. White men couldn't survive for long in Africa, he opined. Its malignancy infected their souls, no matter how much liquor they took, and they took a lot. Doyle, startled by these horrors, spoke of the more wholesome oddities of the Arctic, of a captain who, seeing that it was light for 24 hours a day, decided to change day for night, and of the massive white bears stretched out full length on their stomachs, wrapping their great paws around an ice hole, waiting patiently for a seal to come up for a breath of air, and when it did, whack, lunch was served. Clever creatures, chuckled Wallace, amused by this image. At length, the two men in companionable spirits agreed to take a turn on the quarter deck, where the passengers were strictly forbidden to roam. Wallace swept a sharp eye over his vessel to the bow, to the waist, the strolling passengers on the saloon deck, and at last to the horizon, which was shrouded in a damp mist. The fresh air of the morning had given way to an oppressive humidity, and the doctor would have shed his coat had he not thought it an impropriety. As they contemplated the lazily lapping waves, the dog watch went down and the first watch came on, saluting their fellows as they passed with mild humor. Was it mither right, said one cheerily, sell the farm and gang to sea. They'll sleep tonight, Wallace observed, and dry for a change. Was the folks so flooded, asked the doctor. Was it indeed? Their beds were awash, and the cook got up the stove, so it was a veritable steam bath, I'm told, and they could hardly find their way about their slops. They are stalwart fellows, Doyle opined. Again, Wallace fixed upon his medical officer a stern look. Then he turned away and positioned himself at the rail, gazing out over the water as it streamed away behind them. Dr. Doyle, unflustered, joined him there. I say, <coughs> what's that, said the captain, pointing to the air off the starboard bow. The doctor followed the line indicated by the captain's raised arm. I don't see anything, he said. Don't you, Wallace said, look again. Obediently, the doctor surveyed the sea. It was dark, and the heavy mist confused him, but he thought he did see something, a triangle of brighter white than the mist. He saw it, then it was gone. Then he saw it again. What is it, he asked. It's a ship, Wallace replied. Is it? Is it coming our way? The captain had his binoculars out, and for several moments, he stood at the rail peering through the glasses. The doctor could only try to see, unassisted, what his commander saw, but he made nothing of it, if he ever had. A feeling of helplessness and lethargy it was really so much warmer than one might expect an open deck could ever be, came upon him, and he coughed, trying to clear his head. The evening cocktail ritual might prove a mistake. No, Wallace spoke at last, no, she's gone on. She's on an odd course. He pulled the glasses down and grinned at his companion. She must be the ghost of the Mary Celeste. Doyle recognized the name, as who would not. He was a boy at school when he read about it. It must be 10 years, he thought, since that ship was hauled into Gibraltar for a salvage hearing that quickly became international front page news. A ghost ship she'd been, but was she still? The doctor felt the fine hairs at the nape of his neck stir infinitesimally. The Mary Celeste, he repeated. She was picked up in these waters. It was this time of year. And you think the ship itself is a ghost? The captain grinned again, shaking his head slowly from side to side. No, Doyle, I don't, ma'am. But you're such an impressionable lad, I thought I'd try it out on you. The doctor was unabashed. I haven't thought of that story in years, he said. I recall it was a great mystery at the time. Was it pirates took the crew? I can't remember. There haven't been pirates in these waters in 50 years, said Wallace, and there was no sign of violence and nothing taken. Yes, Phil agreed, that's right. The ship was in good condition, but not a soul on board. Wallace nodded, his brow thoughtfully knit. I knew the captain a little, he said. A Yankee gentleman, upright, family man, name of Biggs, a Tibbs, something like that. I happened to be in port with him at Marseille. It must be 20 years now. He was a young man then and a handsome one. He had his wife along, and she was much relieved to find English speakers. She had no French, and they'd been loading a week. Very dark-eyed, pert creature, confident in that American way, always slyly mocking anything for him. 
I invited them on board for dinner, and we had a pleasant enough time. He was teetotal, but he didn't fuss if others took spirits. I liked him for that. There was nothing puritanical about him. He was a cordial man. I remember one thing, especially about that night. We got to singing around the table, more polite songs than usual because the lady was present, and his wife took a turn. She had a lovely voice, almost a professional voice, and she sang a song I didn't know, an American song, I presume. I'd never heard it before or since, but I recall the refrain. It was, all things love thee, all things love thee, so do I. Wallace tilted his head to one side as if listening to the remembered voice while the doctor studied him with a questioning eye. She stood up to sing, and when she got to that refrain, she turned to her husband, and he, with a smile of pure satisfaction, looked back at her. They looked into each other's eyes, you see, while she told him she loved him, and it was as if there were no other people in the world but those two. The look on her face. I've never thought to bring my missus along on a voyage, but I think if she ever looked at me like that for one moment in my life, well, I might consider it. <laughs> I can tell you there was not a man there that didn't feel envious of Captain Tibbs at that moment. We were all going off to our bunks with a last pot of brandy for a bedmate, and he was going back to his cabin with a woman who adored him. Here Wallace paused, having concluded his story. And the wife and child were aboard when they abandoned ship. Yes, they were never seen again. Wasn't there something odd about the cargo, do you know? Well, that's an interesting detail. The captain kept a dry ship. There was not a drop of spirits allowed above deck, but he had loaded a thousand barrels of alcohol in New York. That fool proctor at the Admiralty hearing tried to make something of that. He was convinced the crew had gotten at the barrels and killed the officers and the family in drunken fury. Then they put down the yawl and sailed away. Doyle considered this scenario. One of them would have had to been able to navigate, he suggested. It was possible, I suppose. It would be if the alcohol was brandy, but it was distilling spirits. If you could make yourself swallow it, it would kill you. Doyle frowned at this thought. So it wasn't mutiny, and it wasn't pirates. No, I mean, yes, it was neither of those. Do you have a theory? I do not. It appeared that she was abandoned in a hurry. That, I believe, is a fact. But she had too much sail set to tie up to her with a painter. <coughs> the salvagers claim must have happened. Any sailor would have more sense than to try that. Ten people in a yawl on the open sea, tying up to a ship rigged to run dead downwind, it would be suicide. So in your view, leaving the ship as they did was an irrational act. <coughs> Wallace expelled a huff of exasperation. You may say so, sir. Doyle pressed his fingertips over his lips, disarranging his mustache. His eyes scanned the horizon, which was dimly visible now, as the mist had cleared and the moon was half full. Then there must have been fog play. <coughs> that, or they were mighty, mightily frightened of something. Yes, out of their senses with fear. But if the captain was, as you say, a steady man of some experience, that's what's always puzzled me about the incident. I can't think the man I met in Marseille would abandon a seaworthy ship in a panic. The doctor smoothed his mustache ruminatively, and the captain moved his head from side to side, pondering the unsolved mystery. Perhaps, concluded the doctor, they didn't all leave at once. <laughs> Right. Um, 
Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can Right. How did you write about the sea so beautifully? I mean, how did you understand it from someone who seems like you've always stood at the shore? I mean, what? You could have just researched that. It's more well, I, I can, you can do. You can learn a lot from research. Um, mm -hmm. And some writers have written about it so uh, just effectively, wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Conrad's book, The Mirror of the Sea, which is about all his feelings about the sea, which are very complex and romantic. Mm -hmm. But he describes things like certain storms. There, and there was a book called After the Storm, which had both horrifying tales of <laughs> ships sinking mm -hmm. and photographs of waves. Mm -hmm. And then my father told me some things about right. being at sea. Right. I remember him telling me that they, he'd been in a hurricane where the, um, he'd gone out and looked up and the waves went as high as the ship. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he was literally looking up at well, I mean, you certainly wall captured that in the first chapter, I think, yeah. that, that, that wall of the water rising, yeah. rising above. I think there's a moment, I'm not sure if it's in Sally's journals, where she says something like, um, that something could be so terrifying in one moment, so beautiful in the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you've really you know, been able to capture that. Well, that seems, that seems <clears throat> to be how people who love the sea feel about it. And, you know, they, they go through all sorts of uh, kind of romanticizing of it, and then after the first really bad storm, there's, right. That's there's just deep respect. <laughs> right. They survived. Right. And some people seem, when they've come through a bad storm, to be enlivened and excited by it and want to go out again and again and again. Yeah, it's, just, it's just astonishing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things I read about was the famous whale of the, Ex the Essex, the, the ship, the Essex, mm -hmm. the supposedly what Melville based Moby Dick on, mm -hmm. a ship that was ran by whales. And the survivors of that ship floated around the Pacific for, I think, something like two or three months. <laughs> and Just floating like on a raft or something? The Pacific is very Pacific. Right, they, right. They were, in a, yeah, they were in a small right, right. They were in a small boat that they managed to get out on. Right. And they, they ate, some, some of them died, and the survivors ate them. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they were finally picked up, um, one of them was holding some bones, and he wouldn't be parted from the bones. And they said, you know, where'd you get those bones? And he gave the name of his first mate. It was horrible, but that captain survived that long, horrible thing, came mm -hmm. back crazy and strange, mm -hmm. and within two years of that, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's like right. the New York Times, you know, it's bad for you, but you know, <laughs> right. right, and yet, I mean, did your, I mean, did your father's <laughs> absence kind of create an allure of the sea for you, to some extent, the fact that he was a sea captain? Well, we, used to be, we used to be able to go on the ship. Keep being cargo passenger ship. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like these wonderful sailing vessels that I'm writing about. But we could go on the ship and see his cabin, and, and as my sister and I climbed up to the ship, all the sailors, it was like a little litany as we walked along. She looks just like you, Captain. She looks just like you. <laughs> it was years well, that's before, interesting. It was years before I understood why. <laughs> but we didn't actually look a lot like my father. So I knew he went to this place, and I had right. seen the place. And he had such a delightful work. Did you draw um, from Violet Petra's state little room? Did that draw from your father at all? Well, yeah, that, 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 that was actually research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were, that ship she sailed on was a real ship, mm -hmm. and that was pretty much how it was decorated. Right. It's amazing what you can find on the internet. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always struck by how much research you do. I mean, property, Mary Riley, this, you know, all, almost all of your books have research in them. I mean, why do you make the job so hard for yourself? Why don't you write about what's happening? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah I mean, you're always at the library. Whenever yeah. I write yeah. at the library. Yeah. Yeah. I still I still do a lot of my own research in the old method, which is to go where the books are and feel around them on the mm -hmm. you know, pick the one the cover that you like. Yeah, I still use a lot of books, and John and Carter had a lot of books. I mm -hmm. almost had a library in my home, right. especially of 19th century stuff. Right. The period, this period, and the period of Mary Riley are pr pretty much the same period. So I had done uh, right, so a lot done, of right. research just about things like what people wore and what they ate and, and um, you know, what kind of illnesses they suffered from. That's what right. most of the, the real research I had to do for this had to do with um, the town of Marion, Massachusetts, which is a very fascinating the whole, the whole coast. Right. That's Sandy Coast. Right. And then a lot about our home and building. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous amount about it. I mean, was that all research? Did you just read as much as you could on him? Or? Yeah, I read probably five biographies, and then he wrote his letters are, are available, and um, and he wrote an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And there's even a little snippet of film you can see. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. You can use to watch the commentary. He's, he's older, and he's talking about his, his favorite spiritualism, mm -hmm. and how he knows it's not something that he believes, it's something that he knows that you can talk to to get better. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Mm. So he wasn't a complete skeptic, you know, that he really was a believer, just a right. total, total yeah. believer. He went into it joining a society that was supposed to be a society of skeptics. Right. They were all really eager to believe it, and he most eager. Right. And he was apparently just the most impressionable, and he created the great detective. So mm -hmm. He was described at seances, at one seance. Um, the, the clairvoyant is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a name, uh, it's, it's, is it Rudder? I, I, I'm hearing it. And, and Dawes says, Rudder. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and other people were there and watched him do that. And they said, he just, you know, and then he comes away saying, How could she have known? But <laughs> 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 he, he believed in it. He was so, um, it's just it's surprising. And he lost all his friends. Um, his wife became a medium and um, took dictation from his dead son. Who, and he spent the last three years of his life going all around the world persuade people that this was the new great religion and that it was going to change the way we thought about life and death. Mm -hmm. Death, life continues. Um, the structure of this novel is incredible to me. I mean, there are court records, there are journals, there are logs, there's poetry, there's just straight narration. What was your point of entry? I started off, I had planned to start off with the diary of the wife of the Mary Celeste, because the, the thing that made me interested in it was that I found out um, that this old mystery, that there was actually a woman in it. Well, I'm always looking for things that have a woman in it. Right. And I hadn't realized that, I thought it was all sailors. So a woman and a two-year-old girl, God, I have a, a, at that time, a two-year-old grandchild. So I had a great, that, that research was easy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to babysit. Yeah. They're all the same, and they all end up in the same. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was. That was I mean, where did the idea, like, you know, you had you known about the Mary Celeste for a really long time? Was it an idea that was sort of churning around in your head for a while? Like, yeah, I had read about it in fifth grade in my weekly reader. Right. You know, it was all the copy, mm -hmm. all the copy, um, mm -hmm. and and I was. It was some of the short things. Right. Mystery of the Sea. It might have been right. two or three, but that one stuck in my mind, mm -hmm. and I'm. I told my father about it, and it was one of the few times that he actually looked at me like I had said something of interest. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he remembered it as well, right. and told me what he knew about it, which was what everybody knows about it, which is nothing. Mm -hmm. like, there's just, there's no way of knowing. This book did not solve the mystery, okay? Right. We, we should have put a disclaimer on it, but <laughs> mystery not solved. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the time said it really well when they said that you're more interested in the questions than in the answers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. I think that I really love that about the book. I, I have to say it's one of the few mysteries I've ever read where the unsolved mystery was just as satisfying. In fact, probably more so than if we knew, you know, exactly what the what the outcome was. So thank you. I may be in the minority. But <laughs> well, I know the Times agreed with that actually. Yeah, yeah they did. They, they, yeah. But how about, what was the, I mean, there's so many different pieces of it, and when you put them all together, it all finally makes sense, but in individual pieces, like what was the, what was the first piece you wrote? Like what, where did you start? The first piece I wrote is I started writing Sailor's Diary. Okay. okay. Right. 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 The second piece. And then I kept thinking, chronologically speaking, I wanted to, I was so saddened and fascinated by the fact that the Driggs family, uh, they, the father was a captain, they had six children, Five died at sea, right. including the daughter. Right. Um, and James was James the one that was left. Yeah, only one. No, only one. He, he he wisely did not go to sea. The, the mother of that family survived five of her kids and two of her grandchildren. Mm -hmm. They were killed at sea, or just well, lost at sea. I went to the graveyard and it's just markers that say L A S L A S. I don't have to remember the one or the other. So it was such a um, you know the thought of that family who were really clearly a very close family. Mm -hmm. And the husband and wife, the captain and his wife, were first cousins. So when right. the children actually lived in the same house together, right. because families were so close and one of them didn't have enough money for a house, basically. Um, so the letters right. survived. And when I read the letters, I knew that I wanted to start with that family. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we talked about- It's so heartbreaking. Yeah. And Hannah. 
Yeah, yeah the story. she's the one who was actually made up. Right. It wasn't a sister, but no one, I never could find anything about her, so I thought that they right. were one girl. Right. They wanted, they wanted and the one she, what she becomes in the novel is also completely yeah, made up. Yeah, that's where, that's where I go. No, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but all the stuff about the rest of the family is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, uh, my sense was, if I'm going to write about this ship, I'm going to think about it. The people who were on it, and then when I started to try to find out who was on it, mm -hmm. I found it about this really amazing, involved family history, mm -hmm. which included a love story that seems to have been a happy marriage. And I don't usually right. write about happy relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. well, but it doesn't end well for them. It doesn't end well, but it's never not in love. Right. So right. it doesn't. Right. Well, like, <laughs> <laughs> it could be, you know, come to blows. I mean, imagine living with your you know, you go up in a tiny cabin for months on end right. with a baby. Right. But you envision this as a happy relationship that ended with this terrible loss. Yeah. And there's a lot of sadness and loss in the book. Yeah. I mean even the in memoriam, I mean the poetry that you quote and Violet's relationship with Ned. I mean how is this a book about longing? I think it is some in some ways about longing and about sadness. Um, and I, you know, I've been thinking about sadness a lot. I wonder if poetry in this period, because so many people have lost their loved ones. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen to us so much anymore. Right. Although, of course, there are people who do lose children. And, and, right. and they're sort of pushed out of, out of the, the center. You don't want to think about the center right. of things. Right. Right. If you haven't suffered loss, then to have suffered loss is, is to be a, a little bit strange. Mm -hmm. But if so many people did suffer loss that they couldn't push everybody away because right. they there would be nobody around, and poets especially entertain um, the notion of, of writing about working through loss. I mean, that's what in the memory is. Right. That's what uh, uh, Wordsworth points. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about the spot of sadness of outgrowing innocence and of understanding that life is loss. Mm -hmm. I'm always attracted to that. And I have a sense that I, mean, I always have some sort of axe to grind on. In, in, this, in this book, What's this, axe? The, this axe is that it's really natural and okay to be sad. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's strange to me how people really don't want to take the time to just be sad. Although Lucy Carson sent an email, I mean, a, a tweet today about a, 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 thing, a guide you can go to, and it's a guide of great and bad places to cry in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody see that? I'm in love with this. <laughs> what's, the, what's the top of the list? Well, well, real good one is the second floor of Dwayne, one of the Dwayne Reeves. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's not oh a lot of people in there. there That's is, hilarious. There you'll be relieved to, she's located a spot in Grand Central where you can have a good cry. I was wondering that because I go through there quite a bit. Yeah, and, and, we, and she, as Lucy says, we all need to be cry. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that made me think, well, maybe Sandis is coming back. That I mean, a person who realizes. <laughs> She says it one day, and she's having a whole day where she's crying, right? so she's right. really doing research. Right. <laughs> it's, right. it's like bathrooms in New York City. Yeah. Where, do you find, yeah. where do you find any of these places that you can sort of yeah. cry? Yeah, right. we can have a cry. Yeah. So that made me feel optimistic that, that people were beginning mm -hmm. to realize that it's okay to be sad. I mean, so I don't want to be sad all the time, I, and I like joy as well, right. and, right. One, and one can feel joy. <clears> but it, the sadness is just one of the emotions that we can feel. It's not an illness. It's not do, easy. do you feel like in our culture we compartmentalize sadness? Like I think people do really just like along with age and other things. Yeah, I, but I think sadness. I don't know, especially young people. They seem to think it, it, it's something really to be avoided. Right. Except for this young woman who's crying. Right. Right. Like there's a vaccination <laughs> for it or something. Like yeah. Kind of well, I, you know, it's partly that, that we call depression a disease, and and I'm sure that there is a kind of clinical depression that's very different from sadness. Right. But. But, there, but sadness is a natural condition mm -hmm. of you know, any observant human. Right. Things are going to make you sad. In fact, I was looking at my, my little granddaughters, and you know, they're just joy. Mm -hmm. They're eating. Oh, I'm eating vegetables. Right. I'm standing up. <laughs> oh, <I'm> standing up. <laughs> <laughs> joy, joy. And I'm watching it because I love that joy. You know? right. And then I think it's it won't last. Right. And that's that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's that, right? But it's okay to be sad, right? And, so, and the whole thing with the spiritualist <clears throat> movement also is that these are people who are trying to reconnect with their, with someone they yeah. lost. Yeah. So it's all about that part of it's all, all 
Yeah, yeah. Us. they're determined that not to be sad. They are going to wait for right. right to remove the contact. Right, cross right. over. Yeah, and they've decided, in fact, to avoid it. They're, they're really, uh, many people in that period are very sort of preoccupied with the notion um, that, that uh, death was something you could work your way around. In fact, I read a, a really interesting article that suggested that it might have been technology that caused the rise of spiritualism because right around the time that it started, the telegraph was invented. Right. This side of the ocean, you hear me on the other side? Yeah. This was new. This was big. And the first spiritualists were in upstate New York, these crazy sisters, the Fox sisters. The first messages sent from the dead guy who was buried, and that was buried downstairs. What's in Morse code? Was in Morse code. It wasn't yeah, in Morse code. just tapping, but it was a tapping. Yeah. Right. And this is how they did it. They'd say, Art, are you happy? Uh, and they'd tap the whole alphabet. And you'd mm -hmm. tap when they hit the right letters. It was very slow to get a message. <laughs> <laughs> and they needed Morse code. Yeah. And the other thing was photography, the eventual photography. And because you had to hold still for so long, if somebody walked across behind you while you're holding very still to the camera, the picture would show a very ghost being the camera just right, behind right. you. And people persuaded that the camera could not lie. Mm -hmm. So photographers had to follow it. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be photographed with a ghost. Right. You couldn't turn around and people learned how to walk across the right. way. Right. Right. <laughs> they also learned how to doctor photoshopping. I mean, this was the early <coughs> photoshop. So that was all, they, they would fake those for people's Yeah, pictures. you'd go to the photo booth and they'd say, we'll do a spirit photograph. It's like the fairy's photos, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And Doyle had a photo he, car he carried with him to the end of his life of his son, who died in the world of Kingsley. He's in a kind of a bubble rising up over his head. And he's going, mm -hmm. <laughs> What is, how, is that? It's a doctored photo. It's a doctored photo. He was, he was convinced. He was convinced. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Can you see that photo? Is it, is it you know? Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, you might, I guess you spirit photographs from the bottom. Right. I mean, talking about spirits, I mean, there's a lot of spirits in this book. I mean, there's there's the ghost of a ship, there's, you know, connecting with the dead, and in a way, I mean, there's a way I think that the book itself almost is a kind of sort of a mystery, a ghost sort of put together. Like, how, I, how long have you been interested in ghosts in that way? <laughs> it's a ghost of a book. Ghost of a book, yeah. I was thinking the other day that I saw one of the standing ghosts of the chain. Ghosts and spirits. I was also thinking, actually, just yesterday about the knowledge of ghosts and spirits. Mm -hmm. uh, spirit being the Latin word, and ghost being the German word. Ghost being guest. And spirit coming from Greek, I think. Right. Uh, Interesting. In, in, to be inspired. Right. And they really are, in my, English has this, John told me in German, it's just ghosts, you don't have this ghost spirit, it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. But we have, and I think it can, in some ways, maybe in this period, that split starts to take place. Mm -hmm. The notion of the spirit is something that's inspiring, and a ghost that's something that comes from the outside. <coughs> right. Like an unwanted ghost. Mm -hmm. An unwanted ghost. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Or the whole ghost. Yeah, holy ghost. Mm -hmm. Which is sometimes called the Holy Spirit. So we right. see those two words coming together. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. So I feel like I've got both spirit and ghosts, mm -hmm. and then duking it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Who wins? No. Sorry. No. And the, you know, your question, which I did hear, is, you know, do I win with ghosts? No. No. Um, I know you don't want to talk about process, but can I just ask you about <laughs> how I I know you write by in pencil and pad? Is that Still, no, I use a pen. Pen. Yeah. <coughs> I even use a ballpoint. Right. No I'm dipping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not quill. You're not using a quill. No quill. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Okay. That's how I started. Right. <laughs> All the ducks that I play. <laughs> 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 so I just use a ball. Um, yeah, I, and I use loose leaf paper, and I get a binder when I start a book, and I take the color. I mean, you will guess what the color of this binder was. It's very blue, um, and so I write. On that, and then after I get about 20 pages, I have to put it in. So I'm always got, I've always got about 20 pages that I haven't put on, and so I can watch the book kind of go over it. Right, but I mean, clearly this is a book that you couldn't have written in sequence. I did not write it in sequence. Right, and it's really a, the first time I've ever. I mean, I've always made it a rule, and I've class at students, and now all students can kind of shut up. 
to take. Never write the end first and always start at the beginning and don't let yourself get ahead. Because mm -hmm. you don't know what's going to happen. And if you right. write it, then you've got to get there. And you want it to grow in an organic way. Right. But that it wouldn't work. For this well, book. it's more of a puzzle. I mean, this book, to me, is yes. a puzzle with it. Did you have to move the pieces around? I literally had the table with the pieces. I and mean, there were a couple of months ago where I just was tearing my hair up. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to really get this I don't know even how it could look. Right. Um, and, and then, I don't know, one day I was still in the I think it was when I solved the mystery, the, the riddle of the giant rat of Sumatra. Oh well, yeah, because you talked about the giant rat of Sumatra. Yeah, and that was when I really started to see my way closer. Okay. Yeah, because it's a, this is interesting. Um, how many people have heard of the giant rat of Sumatra? <laughs> well, we're not Sherlock. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in in Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes stories by Arthur Conan Doyle, one of the later stories is called this story, the, the mystery of the Sussex Vampire. And the story opens with Holmes and Watson. I know you know about them. They're, they're sitting at home, and a letter comes, which is going to bring the, the mystery to their door. And it's, it's signed by someone who said, we want to thank you for your, your work on the Matilda Briggs case. And Holmes says to Watson, the Matilda Briggs was not a woman. It was a ship connected to the giant rat of Sumatra, a case which the world is not ready to hear. Conan Doyle never made any mention of that again. So, <laughs> the, Sherlock, the Sherlock fan, the giant rat of Sumatra, is the, is the case. Right. He never, and there have been a few books solving the case or presenting the case. There's mm -hmm. one, it's a ship full of rats, mm -hmm. and then one, uh, the captain's name is Giant Rat. Or something. So mm -hmm. I'm walking up and down the room thinking, the reason I have to solve the mystery is because Matilda Briggs is the name of a little girl who disappeared from the Mary Celeste. And this was a good 20 years later, mm -hmm. maybe 25 years later. And Doyle had never written about the Mary Celeste again. He felt a little guilty about what he'd done. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't get the names right in the first story. Right. The fact that he would put the name Matilda Briggs mm -hmm. Can't be an no, it can't be an accident. It's not an accident. He's thinking about the Mary Celeste. Right. Well, why is he thinking about the Mary Celeste? Right. So I saw that. But my eureka moment was I was walking around, I had the maps out, I'm thinking, Sumatra. He never went to Sumatra. Where is he? And he's going to find it. And I'm like, okay, Sumatra. Giant rats, do they have giant rats? Good size rats. And then, you know, I have all these things around, and I have this map of London. And right. I looked at London, and I thought, Sumatra Street. Is there one? Yes. Was it up there? The yes. <laughs> and everything so, started falling in place. OK, so you essentially <laughs> solved the Sherlock Holmes mystery for yourself. <laughs> in <order to> <laughs> 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 it is the best solution. It's incredible. It I don't want to give too much away, but it's totally It explains why right. Matilda Briggs has mentioned it again. <laughs> so I was very proud of myself. No one, you know, the only person who's mentioned it is some person on the Amazon who said it's a trick. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good solution. <laughs> um, I think maybe we can start to have some questions yeah. from the audience. Yeah. In your research, did you run across accounts of that were similar of ships being found abandoned? Oh, yeah. No apparent. Well, that's what I thought you were going to say. There were numerous such stories. There were numerous. There was one that was seen so many times going back and forth between Britain and, and the U.S. that they, they had a name for it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you know, it was a ghost ship. Yeah, it, it was a ghost ship. Particularly the uh, common features. Uh, the thing that made this one stand out, there were two things that made this one stand out. Most of the ones that were floating around there, like uh, in many cases, they knew why they were there. Like, um, the people had been taken off by another ship because there was some problem on the ship. Or that they'd been in a storm and everybody you know, had been killed. Or they were in, like this, this one had lost a couple of masts. Got picked up by other, other ships. The odd thing about this ship was that it was clear that there was nothing wrong with it and there was no reason to leave it. And that was what made it special. The other thing was that it, they hadn't left it in a very seeming way. They hadn't lashed the wheel. They hadn't taken down all the sails. They hadn't taken certain things they would have needed with them. They got off fast, is what they, you know, what the conclusion was. So that was what made it stand out. But the other thing was that trial, which went on so long, 
um, was news. Is that the event? Well, it was probably because the proctor decided that the salvers had murdered the crew. And he was trying to make that. First he decided that the crew had gone drunk and killed everybody. And then he dropped that and decided it was the salvers. So he was going to put them under arrest. Ultimately, they were awarded a small amount. And the ship went on and a new captain got on and delivered the alcohol. And ultimately, the ship finished its, its job. Was what he, uh, the accounts of these other ships or these other experiences, mm -hmm. whether there were common features that might have been applied to the oh, Celeste story mm -hmm. to help explain mm -hmm. what happened in the Celeste? Yeah, I, I, I see what you're suggesting. Um, yeah, I don't think that anybody's ever satisfactorily come up with. I mean, if they had, everyone was ill, sometimes people found abandoned ships that were full of dead people. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. happened a lot because you know, people got um, I think every every solution that would have worked was there was something that suggested it wasn't that. So that was probably the source of the energy that kept the inquiry going on for mm -hmm. all the yeah. days. Yeah, nothing trying to prove or disprove. Nothing was satisfactory. Even uh, insurance fraud was brought up because there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. There were ships. I think there's one right now that's floating around full of rats. Still so the rats, right? right? I was just oh, going to mention the one that's floating around with rats. I mean, that, and that is just a case of nobody wants to have to be responsible for this ship because it's in bad condition. That happened a lot. But this ship was not in bad condition. And it couldn't be insurance for it because, in fact, they actually delivered the cargo. So. Strange story. It is. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. After doing all this research, do you have a hypothesis of what happened? I, you know, the only. I, I, you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I don't have a hypothesis about what happened. I have a, a hypothesis about something that may have affected what happened. And I'll tell you what it is. My favorite, that I, I mean, I've looked at this before, my favorite is people say aliens. <laughs> aliens. Aliens is definitely one. And there's also the giant squid. Yeah. <laughs> there's I like that one. Water spout. Forget it. Water spout. Water spout. Water spout. Another one was some, some guy who was in his ship and he actually wound up on land and everybody got off and started walking around and then the land sank. So they thought that could, that could happen. <laughs> but that's never happened in those waters, those nice deep waters. And would everyone get off the ship? Not everyone would. Never, no, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Every time, every time you hear one, aliens is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't the what happened to the Mary Celeste after it was it was a bad luck ship? Yeah, that's that's what I remember you telling. Yeah, it oh, was. Just, yeah, I mean, first of all, who would sail on the Mary Celeste? Nobody would have history. Yeah. But that's right. They did. They had trouble you know, getting the crew, and when they finally got back to New York, and people came down to see it and were horrified by it. Nobody wanted to buy it. Um, but it was so, it did run for a while, and mm -hmm. sort of bad luck, things not working, uh, stolen damage, and finally it was mm -hmm. running around off the coast of um, Haiti. And deliberately. Was, deliberately. Oh, this was real. Really? This was real insurance fraud. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, the captain was um, tried and you know, they caught, I forget what they called it. <laughs> no, he didn't, wasn't caught, he was arrested. I forget what they called it. Baron of Truth. Baron of Truth? Baron of Truth. Yeah, Baron of Truth. Right? Which is basically insurance fraud. Right. Yeah, he had, he had actually loaded the ship with. What he said were very valuable things, but when they started to dig up, because the ship went down the roof, so they were able to pull some of the stuff out. There were big boxes of old shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really, you know, shocking thing. So it was, a, it was a bit like Clive Kusler, I think, Kusler, was Kusler. one of those digged up ships. Yeah, he dug up some pieces of it. Very strange. A couple more questions. Is there anything you want to talk about? No, I think I can. How about what's next? For you? She's still on board. Oh, I'm not going to answer that. Yeah. That's too bad. <laughs> yeah, I really don't have any idea. I have a lot of ideas. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which one. Right. 
I'm not going to write about a seagull. No. <laughs> <laughs> These are fashion classics. Oh, yeah, I have another book out about seafaring, which is a children's book. It's called Anton and Cecil Cats at Sea. And, and I had some real fun with this because it's about these two cats who wind up on a, on a ship. One gets um, commandeered and put on the ship because they need cats for rat catchers. And his brother goes out on the next ship trying to find them, and so they follow each other <laughs> around. And at one point, one of the cats, Anton, his name for Anton Cheko, winds up on a ship with some people that are real nice to him, and, and he gets to be friends with this Miles Aronis, and, and he gets up one day, and other people are gone. Again. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to do it twice. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the did you have any questions? I was wondering, did you have a sense uh, once you had um, felt you were reaching the end of trying to establish when to let go, since you couldn't achieve the most, the simplest goal, explaining, and you had to come to terms with that? I did have a lot of trouble with that. Shifted gears and said, "I'm on the trip, but it's I can get there." Yeah, yeah, and I knew I wasn't. I always knew I was not going to solve it. I never set out to solve it, mm -hmm. and I always knew. Um, I, I always knew what the wife would be doing on that scene, but I didn't know quite how or what it would be. And I wrote a couple of versions, one of which my same page is. Scroll, hard work. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went back to drawing board, using coffee on the phone. And then I, I, it was a wonderful thing when I finally found it because it was like Eureka. I felt happy with it because I sobbed. Oh, really? <laughs> Did you? It, 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 it is so sad. It's so sad. And I cried. <laughs> and so then I knew I was. <laughs> you say sad. <laughs> yeah, one. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you very much for coming.